Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the John Campia podcast here on my YouTube channel. I am, of course, your host, John Campia, and it is awesome to have you here kicking off the brand new week on this Monday morning. I'm getting to show up a little bit later than normal today because I was out late last night. I went to go see John Williams in concert again. A buddy of mine had some extra tickets and he had sweet tickets, like sixth row private box with table and food. And ah, I'll tell you, man, every time like that first horn blows for John Williams Superman theme, like the audience freaks out and it sends chills down your spine. Of course, all the Star Wars stuff played a lot of Harry Potter, played some Indiana Jones. They played some classic stuff. They played some this wonderful montage of Judy Garland uh, from A Star Is Born, I believe it was. And it was just amazing. Such an amazing night. I'm so glad I got to go see it twice this weekend. But anyway, we're here to talk about some new topics today. And where do I get my topics from? I pick out the topics and questions from questions that you guys send in to me. How do you get a topic or a question to me for the John Campia podcast? Simple. Just email me anytime at the John Campia podcast at gmail.com. That's the John Campia podcast at gmail.com. Send them on in. Maybe you'll see your topic or question pop up on the show. And if you want a little bit of a sneak peek as to which topics and questions are being covered today, look in the description of the video below and you'll see them there. All right. So without any further ado, let's dive into it. Let's get into question number one today. And question number one today comes to us from one of my Patreon supporters. And I'll, let me give my little shameless plug here for my Patreon. As many of you know, I left the corporate world. I no longer do this for corporations and for their interests. I wanted to have the freedom to do it my own, on my own, talk about things I want to talk about, all that kind of stuff. So I decided to branch out on my own. But that's an expensive thing to do to full time when you're making 70 to 100 videos a month. My Patreon supporters help me do it. If you're interested in becoming one of my Patreon supporters, take a look at this link and take a look around and maybe being a Patreon supporter is good for you. And if you don't want to be a Patreon supporter, that's totally fine too. All right, let's get on to the question from Patreon supporter David Lloyd, who writes, Hey, John, I was wondering, what is your favorite out of the Denis Villeneuve directed films? And how high is your anticipation levels for Blade Runner 2049? Thanks for answering my question and keep up the good work. Yeah, if you want to talk about a director who's on a bit of a roll, uh, Denis Villeneuve is definitely the guy. He's definitely one of those guys, at least at any rate. So he's have a, he's got a number of very, very good films out there. And contrary to popular belief, like a lot of people keep asking me, hey, John, what was it about Arrival that made you hate it so much? It's like, mm, I never said I hated Arrival. All I said was, I do think it was overrated. Yes, I do. But I like the film. I like the movie. I watched it. I liked it. It was a good film. I gave it a thumbs up. But I didn't think it was like one of the top five of the year or anything like that. And that translated, it drives me crazy. That translated to people saying, John hated Arrival. No, you brain dead buffoon. If I hated Arrival, I would have said I hated Arrival. I liked Arrival. Gave it a positive review. Thumbs up. I just didn't think it was top five. But at any rate. So, and people wonder why when I communicate, I repeat things a lot. I repeat things a lot because if I don't repeat things a lot, people say things like, John hated Arrival. No, no, I didn't. I never said I hated Arrival. Anyway, beyond that, I thought Arrival was a good film. Sicario was obviously a really solid, really, really good film. He's got a number of them and obviously he's got Blade Runner 2049 coming out. But my favorite one, and I, it's funny because I don't hear a lot of people talking about this, is Prisoners. The one you do with Jake Gyllenhaal and uh, Hugh Jackman, that movie is like, that movie will mess with your head. It's so good. And the way it examines the human condition and how we can go from point A to point B, what can drive us, what can change us from being this to being this in the blink of an eye. And it's just, so just forget the human study part of it. It's just the story is compelling and you're drawn into it and it's amazing and heartbreaking and heart pounding all at the same time. It's such a wonderful film. And not a lot of people saw it. I highly suggest if you appreciate Villeneuve's films, make sure you watch Prisoners. You will be glad that you did. Incredibly strong performances, really great script, obviously brilliant directing in it. Check it out. Now, on to the part of your question about how high are my anticipation levels for 2049, uh, Blade Runner 2049. Honestly, not that high. Look, I know it's a very, very popular film. And I know that a lot of people aren't going to like that I'm saying my anticipation levels aren't super high for it, but you know me, I have to be honest with you. I, it would be a lot easier for me to say, yeah, I can't wait to see it. So everybody will like me, but I, I, I've got to be honest with you. 
Um, and that stems from a couple things. And first of all, I am looking forward to seeing it. It's just that I don't have, I'm not jumping out of my chair. It's not one of my top five most must see movies between now and the end of the year. It's just, it's just not for a couple of reasons. Number one, I did not like the first trailer at all. I actually, I thought the first trailer was quite bad. And I think the only reason anybody got excited about the first trailer simply was because of the name Blade Runner. That's it. I, if, I think if you look, sit down objectively, take Blade Runner out of it and just watch that trailer, I don't think it's a very good trailer. Now, total, you know, 180 for the second trailer. I did like the second trailer. I thought the second trailer was a good trailer all on its own right. Whether it was about a Blade Runner film or not, I thought the second trailer was quite good. So I'm interested in the film. I'm looking forward to seeing it, and of course, because it's being directed by Villeneuve, who, and I like all of his other films. The other reason I'm not super stoked for Blade Runner 2049 is because I'm one of those rare people you read about that didn't actually like the first Blade Runner. I know, and all my friends love Blade Runner. Blade Runner. All my friends love Blade Runner, and I'm not about to sit here and have an argument with you that Blade Runner isn't a good movie. No, I acknowledge I'm in the minority, but all film is subjective. It didn't hit me quite the right, the right way. I've tried it a couple of times. I've watched it a couple of times, and it just doesn't click for me. That doesn't mean it shouldn't click for everybody else, and that it's not a masterpiece, and that it's not you know clearly one of the most influential sci-fi films ever made. It clearly is. Um, and all that kind of stuff. But to be honest, you know, it just didn't do it for me. I am curious about this new film. I'm interested in the new film. I'm going to see it the first chance that I get. But I have to be honest, it's not super high on my on my anticipation level. And here's open. It's awesome. All right. Thanks a lot for the question, David. We move on now to the second question. And the second question also comes to us from one of my Patreon supporters. This one comes to us from Joe Zapata, who writes... Hi, John. I hope you are safe with the recent fires. I'll talk about that in a second. I need a percentage from you. What is your percentage Green Lantern will pop up in Justice League? Well, thanks a lot for the question, Joe. Yeah, and if you're wondering what he means by staying safe in the fires, I live at the foot of the Burbank Hills, the hills here in Burbank. Like, it's just they're right outside my window. And if any of you have been following my channel, you know that recently Burbank has been on fire. They're calling it the biggest fire in Los Angeles history. And it's been raging for a couple of days. And I put up a video where you could see like the from my window and from my house, you could see the flames and the <laughs> coming in. Um, but last night, we actually had a bit of rain, not a ton of rain, but we actually had a bit of rain. And I think that helped a lot because as I was driving back from the John Williams concert last night towards the Burbank Hills, I didn't see the sky glowing anymore. I didn't see any fire. Now, I, that doesn't necessarily mean I could be wrong. I don't think the fires are all completely out, but I think they're mostly under control. Last I heard, despite the fact that it was the biggest fire in Los Angeles history, only two homes and in total three structures got burned. And those were homes and structures that had no brush clearance, like they were pushed right in the mountains, right up against the brush. And uh, apparently nobody was hurt other than some firefighters who had heat exhaustion. But, uh, you know, for the biggest fire in Los Angeles history, uh, we got off pretty scot-free. Uh, it looks like we got off pretty scot-free. I mean, 6,000 acres of burn, and that's a tragedy, but no, no property, I mean, on any grand scale, no property was damaged and uh, nobody was hurt. Like uh, other than the firefighters getting heat exhaustion in the midst of doing their heroic jobs. And uh, we got pretty lucky. We got really, I honestly thought uh, my apartment was going to burn. I really did. Uh, I thought my apartment was going to burn, but you know what? It's, it's just stuff. It's just stuff. Stuff can be replaced. Anyway, so going on now to the bigger part of the question here, what is the percentage I think that we actually see Green Lantern pop up in the Justice League? And look, it's, it's not high, but it's not like it's at zero either. I don't think it's high because I think we would have heard about it by now. But we don't always hear about it. Sometimes, on a rare occasion, studios are able to keep a secret from us. It doesn't happen often, but it happens. The other thing is this, is that, you know, we heard Henry Cavill himself teasing and talking about a Green Lantern. Now, he, now, he never said Green Lantern's in the movie, but he's teased Green Lantern and he's talked about Green Lantern. And obviously in that most recent Justice League trailer, there is a reference to the Green Lantern core, you know, it, where um, uh, Steppenwolf says there's no lanterns here. So, I mean, he wasn't specifically talking about Hal Jordan or anybody else, but he does reference the Green Lantern Corps. So you have to take that into consideration. Percentage chance. I'll go 20%. I'll, and that's a fairly high number. I'll go as high as 
I'll believe there's a one in five chance that actually Green Lantern shows up, which means if I had to put money on it, I would, there's an 80% chance he won't. I don't think Green Lantern will be there, but it's a high enough chance that I'm not going to fall over from shock if at some point the camera turns and there's a glowing Hal Jordan or John Stewart or Kyle Rayner or Guy Gardner or some other Green Lantern standing there. Uh, Kilowog. I don't know. Maybe Kilowog will be standing there. I don't know. But I, I think there is a chance. I, I wouldn't bet on it, but I think there's a chance I'll go as high as 20%. All right. Thanks a lot for the question, Joe. We move on now to the next question. This one's going to get some debate going. It comes to us from Omer Safik, who writes, Hey, John, big fan since the AMC days from Saudi Arabia. Yes, you have fans here. Thank you so much, Omer. It's great to hear. Um, my question is, With recent Warner Brothers news, I have a real problem with The Hollywood Reporter. They were considered a reliable source of scoops and stories, but lately they've become rumor mongers with news of Affleck leaving, then Joker movie, then DiCaprio being considered. They don't give concrete stories. Neither have Warner Brothers confirmed anything yet. What is your take on it? Thanks and bring on the filthy. Well, thanks a lot for the question. And this actually brings up a huge topic. And really, I should be doing a standalone video about this topic. But I mean, I'll just, I'll address it here, whatever. Um, And Omer brings up a point that I've been seeing a lot of lately, which is a backlash against the the media, the true media. I'm not talking about bloggers and mid-level sites. I'm talking about the true media. In the world of entertainment, that's only a handful of outlets. It's The Hollywood Reporter. That's Variety. For the most part, that's Deadline. And sometimes it's The Wrap. But there are uh, some major players here. And what he's talking about is these reports that have come out that, first of all, there was that big report that came out in The Hollywood Reporter that Ben Affleck, this was at during Comic-Con going on, that Ben Affleck, Warner Brothers was planning his exit. Uh, then there was the story about how Warner Brothers is looking at doing a standalone Joker film with Martin Scorsese. Then there was a report coming out that their first pick, the person they'd, they'd ideally like to have play the Joker is Leonardo DiCaprio. Now, here's the thing. There have been people, particular DC fans, and I'm not picking on DC fans here because trust me, if the situation were reversed, Marvel fans would be just as bad. We're all equally bad here, okay? All of us are equally bad. This just happens to be a circumstance where it's we're, it mostly revolves around DC, so for now it's that. But make no mistake about it, DC fans are no worse than, than Marvel fans and all that kind of stuff, okay? So understand that. We're talking about all of us here. But it seems like all of us are fine with the news and we trust news sources until they start saying things we don't like about the things we like. Then all of a sudden, they're just spreading gossip. Well, wait a minute. No, no, no. You understood that they're a reliable news outlet, and you understood that if they report things 99% of the time, it's accurate, and you were comfortable with the fact that even when they say things that aren't popular, you know they usually turn out to be true, and you were fine with that, and you understand that they have to keep their sources confidential, and you understand all that. Oh, you understood all that until they started talking about something you like. Now it's a problem. Now it's a problem. And it's it's the whole, and I'm not trying to get political thing here, but it's that whole Trump phenomenon where if any if a news outlet says something you don't like, just call it fake news and move on. Just call it fake news and move on. Attack instead of you know addressing the issues, attack the messenger and try to um, delegitimize the messenger as if that delegitimizes the message. So let's start with the Ben Affleck thing. Okay, whether or not you believe that Ben Affleck is ultimately going to be leaving as Batman or not. Okay, take that out of it. Let's just look at this situation. The Hollywood Reporter, one of the true pillars of entertainment journalism, wrote an article claiming that they have sources that that they re- trust and they totally rely on. This is the Hollywood Reporter. This isn't Bobby Joe Bimbob's blog, okay? This is the Hollywood Reporter saying that Warner Brothers is indeed planning the exit of Ben Affleck, that it's understood in their circles that Ben Affleck is not going to be Batman much longer. Okay, so they write that story. Also keep in mind specifically who wrote the story, okay? It's not just the Hollywood Reporter. It's who from the Hollywood Reporter reported this story. Who was it that actually wrote that Ben Affleck is, you know, that their sources are telling them that Ben Affleck is leaving? And it's a reporter by the name of Kim Masters. Now, Kim Masters is a legendary 
Hollywood journalist, legendary. Do some Google searching on Kim Masters and Hollywood Reporter. She's a legendary figure in the world of entertainment journalism, okay? And she is on the Peabody Board of Jurors, okay? She's on the Peabody Board of Jurors. That's what Kim Masters is. That's who this reporter is. I mean, she's on this, this is a handful of people on the Peabody, including like, like a heads of journalism at USC and all this kind of stuff. Those are the other people who make up the board of jurors for the Peabodies, okay? So this is the individual. This is the person with her decades long of studio contacts and her close relationships, her legendary status in the business. And she specifically wrote this story that came out during Comic-Con about the Ben Affleck issue and said, yeah, they're doing it. And they said that Warner Brothers will deny it. They have to because they can't have the story coming out that Ben Affleck is leaving until after Justice League comes out. They can't. They absolutely can't. I remember I made a video the night before the DC panel. This story from The Hollywood Reporter had come out. And, you know, and Kim Masters said, no, my people at Warner Brothers have told me they're, it's, it's, it's a done deal. Ben Affleck is leaving. Uh, they're planning his exit. They called it a graceful exit. They're planning a graceful exit, uh, which means they will come up with, which means that when they ultimately do announce that Ben Affleck is no longer going to be Batman, they're going to come up with some story as to why. It'll be some story. Um, and the, the like, as if they didn't decide months ago that he wasn't going to be Batman anymore. But anyway, I made a video that night saying, and I put out a tweet saying, tomorrow at the DC panel, Warner Brothers, if I'm the president of Warner Brothers, you have to deny this. They have to deny it. Because to not deny it right before Justice League comes out is a PR disaster for Justice League. They cannot have that. So until Justice League has done its theatrical run, you're not going to hear any acknowledgement from anybody. But Kim Masters, with her relationships, with all of her contacts at Warner Brothers, she said with her legendary status in Hollywood, this is what's happening. But DC fans didn't want to hear that. So they instantly turn on the Hollywood reporter. Here's a great situation. Here's a great illustration of this. Okay. So um, like the, in this, again, it's just because of this one situation. I am a DC fan. I am a DC fan. I, I love the DCEU. But so I, I count myself in this too. But you know, there have been a lot of reports that came out from Variety and the Hollywood Reporter and whatever that the, the reshoots were, have been extensive, much more extensive than originally claimed. Um, that Warner Brothers has spent upwards of $25, $30 million on the research, which to me is awesome news because it shows that Warner Brothers is truly committed to giving the audience the best movie possible. Uh, and all this kind of stuff. But the DC fans just yell, fake news, fake news, fake news. You're not giving sources. Yeah, it's fake news. But then some guy, I'm not exaggerating here, some guy on a YouTube channel that had like 3,000 views said, I've heard that um, the only reason the reshoots have gone this long is because of people's schedules, right? Variety on this side, Hollywood Reporter, blah, 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 all telling you this, media can't be trusted. Some guy on a YouTube channel and by the way, I know the guy on the YouTube channel and he's a good guy and he's a smart guy, but still some guy on a YouTube channel that had like the video had like 3000 views says what the DC fans want to hear. And the DC fans started sharing that video saying, see, those reports were wrong because this guy on this 3000 view YouTube video said so. So it's like, oh, okay. So you totally believe the media when it's saying what you want them to say. But when you get the major outlets saying something else, you call them fake news. And that's what we do. That is a human thing. It's not a DC fan thing. That's not a Marvel thing. That's a human thing. It's something we do. And it is infuriating. It does drive me nuts that we seem to constantly do this. All right. Anyway, that's just my kind of uh, take on the situation. Really, I could do like a three-hour thing on it, but I don't want to waste too much time on this. So thank you so much for the question, Omer. I hope I, I shed some light on my perspective on all this. Anyway, okay, let's move on to the next question. And the next question comes to us from Jack Spittle, who writes, Hi, John. I started watching your channel for about a month now, and so far I'm obsessed. Well, thank you so much, Jack. My question Due to all, to, due to the All Hallows Eve season coming, that's Halloween for everybody else, 
What do you think will be the top performing horror film that weekend? Will it be Jason Bloom's new Happy Death Day? Or will it be the eighth installment in the Saw franchise with Jigsaw? Not to mention others, but my money is on Jigsaw. Would love to know your opinion. Yeah, Jason Bloom has, or Blum, I should say, has put together just a sharp, sharp studio in Bloomhouse. They're making low budget movies and making really decent profits on low budget, reasonably budget, budgeted films. And for the most part, doing some pretty quality stuff. Not all their films have been great, but a lot of them have been. He's doing such a, they're doing such a great job over there at Bloomhouse. So they've got this movie coming out called Happy Death Day. You can see the trailer on YouTube if you haven't seen it yet. And then this brand new Jigsaw movie is coming out. Which one will dominate? Easy. No questions asked. It's going to be the Jigsaw movie. It's going to be the new Saw movie. Like, whereas the Bloomhouse films make nice little profits. They're, you know, we're talking about nice little profits. When a movie makes 30 and $40 million, that's profitable because they made the movie for 8 million bucks. You know what I mean? Happy Death Day does not look good. Uh, the movie might end up being great. I haven't seen it yet. I'm just saying the trailer is not good. It's kind of a ridiculous title. I don't, I wish they had gone with a different title. But even the last Saw movie, which I think was Saw 3D, which at that point, the, everybody was just frustrated with the franchise and kind of bored of it. And it still made over a hundred and something million dollars. So it was still, I think, $145, $150 million, something like that. And now it's been a number of years since we've had a Saw film. And the first trailer for the Saw film, this new Saw film, it was great. So you got a recognizable franchise, really good trailer, a history of success. And yeah, to me, it's no question, no question the Saw franchise will definitely do better than Happy Death Day. Although, I, again, because it's a Bloomhouse film, I'm sure Happy Death Day will do pretty damn well. All right, thanks a lot for the question, Jack. We move on now to the next question. And the next question comes to us from Brian Knight. And Brian Knight writes, Why is canon absolute in Star Wars, except when George Lucas makes changes? You provided a strong argument about canon. For those of you who don't know, he, I talked about you can't touch the prequels because they're canon and how we should fight to protect the prequels, even though I don't like the prequels, but we should. We should protect the prequels because they're canon. Anyway, so this question from Brian Knight is in response to that. So he goes on to say, you provided a strong argument about canon, but failed to explain how Lucas changes in the original trilogy, how Lucas's changes in the original trilogy is or isn't changing canon. While most of the changes were cosmetic and not plot related, you still have to address the cantina scene with Greedo. If Lucas can make changes and revisions, then the entity Lucasfilm would have the right to make changes and revisions to the prequels. Thanks a lot for the question, Brian. And I, you would not believe how many people I had responding to me. Like, cause I said on my video, I believe it was yesterday or the day before saying you cannot touch the prequels because they are canon. Even though I don't like the prequels, they are canon and canon is important. Canon means something in Star Wars more than any other film franchise. Because when you, Disney dubs something canon, that means it's official history. You can't just go around changing history, okay? Because I mentioned like, and once Disney bought it, boom, they put the canon stamp. They established definitively what is canon and what is not and all that kind of stuff. But so I had a lot of people, not just Brian, writing to me and saying, well, John, you're forgetting Lucas and the special editions. Lucas changed the films. Now, mostly the changes were just updated special effects and stuff like that. And this song was saying instead of that song. But, you know, these situation of uh, Han shot first. Again, I would argue that isn't really changing canon because canon is Greedo and Han had a confrontation in the uh, cantina and Han ended up killing Greedo and walked out. That hasn't changed. That's the important thing. The minutia detail about who shot first. Yes, George Lucas changed that. However, that was all before Disney. What I said in my video was that once Disney got it, they put the stamp on what is canon. They defined what is canon and what is not. Because canon under George Lucas's reign, and I worship at the altar of George Lucas, everybody knows this, but canon under George Lucas was a fucking mess. It was a mess. They had like eight different levels of canon. And they the, the, there was A canon. There was B canon. There was C canon. Then the ultimate canon was G canon, which stood for George. G canon was the ultimate canon. So they would say, oh yeah, that story in that novel's that's canon. 
it's not G level canon, but it's canon. So canon, like under the Lucas era, was one of the most confusing things because even they didn't know what the hell they were talking about, except G canon. G canon was what was in the movies and what was in the uh, Clone Wars TV show. And to George Lucas, that was G canon. But then everything else was, yeah, 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 that story, that's uh, sort of canon. And that's sort of canon. And that's sort of canon. And canon was this complete mess of a thing. Then Disney came along. And what maybe one of the best things that Disney did was once they acquired Lucasfilm, they threw almost everything out and said, none of that is canon. Heir to the Empire, not canon. The Yu Zhang Vong storyline, not canon. The X-Wing series, Rogue Squadron series, not canon. They threw all that and they clearly defined, here's what is canon. The movies are canon. The animated series, not including droids. The uh, <laughs> the um, Clone Wars, Rebels, that's canon. And moving forward, all new novels are also canon. Everything else before that and everything else around that and outside of these clearly defined things are no are not canon whatsoever. We give them a new label called Star Wars, I think it's called Legends. Yeah, Legends. We'll call it Star Wars Legends stuff or Expanded Universe Legends, but it's none of that other stuff is canon. So now everything post George Lucas, I mean post George Lucas's ownership, I should say, Disney clearly defined what is canon. As far as the differences between the original Star Wars trilogy and the special edition Star Wars trilogy, sadly, what is canon is the special edition. Because George Lucas defined, this is these are now the true versions of these movies. And that's what he, you know, Disney had to agree to that. And so that is what canon is. So it's pointless to say, well, George Lucas changed this and George Lucas changed that. Yeah, but that's all before Disney owned it. Everything that happened as far as canon talk goes prior to Disney owning Lucasfilm is irrelevant. All of that is irrelevant. It's what is canon once Disney defined what canon is. And once Disney put their stamp on what canon is, it can't be changed. That is now canon. Guess what? In canon, Greedo shot first. I don't like it. I don't like it. To me, Han always shot first. But in canon, Greedo shot first. So uh, even if you hear Kathleen Kennedy joke and saying Han shot first, yeah, she'll say that, but canon is Greedo shot first, even though we all acknowledge Han shot first. It's one of those weird things. But it absolutely makes no difference what George Lucas did back then, because that was all pre-Disney. Once Disney became the owners and they said, this is what canon is, it's official, it's done, it's set in stone. Anyway, so that's why there's a difference between what George Lucas did and the current situation that we have now. Thanks a lot for the question, man. All right, now we move on to the final question of the day. And the final question today comes to us from Ivan Rojas, who writes, Greetings from Venezuela. Thank you so much, Ivan. I want to know your opinion about the upcoming Professor Marston and the Wonder Women. I just found out about this movie and the premise is very interesting and the trailer is fine. But I did a little bit of research about the writer-director, and she hasn't done anything of note, so that's given me a little bit of pause. Keep bringing the filthy. Yeah, if you guys have not heard about this movie uh, coming out, uh, Professor Marston and the Wonder Woman, and have not seen the trailer, jump on YouTube immediately and find the trailer. Professor Marston and the Wonder Woman. It's about – it's much like that upcoming movie um, – with uh, with the Christopher Robin movie about the guy who actually created Winnie the Pooh and his son, Christopher Robin. I think it's called Goodbye, Christopher Robin or something like that. Anyway, it also reminds me a lot of that Benedict Cumberbatch movie, Imitation Game. It's a true story based on the guy who created Wonder Woman. He's also the same guy who created the lie detector. Like he's a, he's a scientist anyway. And it's fascinating. So apparently like this guy uh, it's being played by Luke Evans, and everybody knows what a big Luke Evans fan I am. And his wife, and his wife is being played by Rebecca Hall, and I'm a huge Rebecca Hall fan. She does not star in enough movies. She's amazing. Anyway, so Luke Evans plays the doctor and his wife, and they're both like professors as well, I believe. And anyway, so they're a married couple, and he's creating this, he's trying to create this comic. But anyway, him and his wife, they do something that is even still considered a little unusual today, but back then completely nuts. It would have been considered is that the two of them, the husband and the wife, they fell in love. Both of them fell in love with this other girl. 
And they developed a three-way relationship that their relationship was him, her, and her. That was their relationship. They were all in this relationship together. Now it's very edgy for the time. It would even, it would still be considered a little bit edgy today, but that was what they were. Uh, and in real life, apparently I was reading that after he died, the two women, they stayed together and they continued raising the kids and they, all that. Kind of, anyway, it's a great story, but you know, the themes and things that he was doing in the Wonder Woman comics brought him under a lot of public fire and public scrutiny and persecution and stuff like that. And it's just the trailer so has sold me immediately. Again, if you have not seen the trailer to this, go look it up on YouTube immediately. I think this story looks fascinating because again, it, it deals with, it's not dealing with Wonder Woman per se. It's dealing with the human beings behind it and what they went through trying to create this thing and bringing it to us and, you know, the, the, their lifestyle. And it's just, it looks fascinating and it's filled with actors that I completely adore. And the movie looks amazing. Again, check it up. It's Dr. Marston and the Wonder Women, all about the guy who created the Wonder Woman comic and how that relationship that uh, I can't remember the official Polly Morris relationship. I can't remember how to pronounce the name. Anyway, that relationship between the three of them is what really led to the creation of Wonder Woman and, and what it's things he got out of that relationship that went in and became you know, staples of the Wonder Woman character. Go check it out. It's absolutely fantastic. I absolutely love it. I cannot wait to see this movie. Anyway, guys, that will do it for me for this installment of the John Campion Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Listen, while you're here, take a second, click the subscribe button, become a subscriber to my YouTube channel. Follow me on social media, simply at John Campion. That'll do it for me for now, guys. Thanks so much for joining me. And until the next video, bye-bye.